This episode of All About the Gear is brought to you by BorrowLenses.com. And here we are. We are back with yet another episode of All About the Gear. We are up to episode number nine right now, Doug. Do you believe that? Nine. We're almost in double digits. We are. We're, We're going to be there very soon. <laughs> yes, we are. So what this episode is all about, and let's get right to it, is the new Canon 70D. And you and I spoke a little bit about this earlier. And uh, just to foreshadow it a little bit, there's not a whole lot of big changes in this camera. And you're going to outline what has changed because there's one significant change in this. Um, and you're going to demystify that for us and sort of dive into it. So, but first of all, I'm Frederick Van Johnson. And who are you again? Uh, I am Doug K. I'm one of the many Doug Ks, but I am the <laughs> only one at DougK.com. Awesome. There's there's more than one Doug K, really? Oh, there are. We have, uh, let's see, there's a doctor at Stanford, there's an actor in Georgia. Uh, it's a, you know, there's a little club going on there. Yeah. Well, you know what? Frederick Van Johnson, only one. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a lot of Fred Johnsons, but right. only one Frederick Van Johnson, as you can only imagine. One. There, there I use my full name. <laughs> there couldn't be any more. <laughs> That's right. Well, cool. Let's dive right into it. So, the Canon 70D. Uh, initial impressions. Is this a remarkable camera? Do you, should people rush out to buy it right now? What do you think? Well, that's a you know, it's a very good question, of course. Uh, as we'll see, it's a really interesting camera from a technology point of view. Uh, I think it's particularly good for video, and if that's important to you, then you might want to rush out and buy it. But wait till you hear the rest of the review. In mm -hmm. fact, you can also go to uh, DougK.com, go to All About the Gear, and from there you can find uh, Episode 9 of All About the Gear, where I have a long-form a review in uh, with a lot more details that we're going to cover here. More more than you ever wanted to know is there. Comprehensive is the term we like to That's use. Right. <laughs> That's cool. So then uh, the first thing I have some notes here about things to ask you. Um, lenses, like the the lenses that you that the, particularly the kit lens that comes with this thing. You, I know you did some tests with different glass on it. How does it stand up? Yeah, the um, let's take a look at this one here, which is the it, you can buy it in a kit. Well, first of all, the, the basic camera costs twelve hundred dollars with no lens, or about fifteen fifty with the kit lens. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's take a look here. The kit lens is the eighteen to one thirty five, which I can show you here. I'm so well organized today, you wouldn't believe it. Um, the eighteen to one thirty five. Um, has a, a zoom lock on it. It's got uh, um, optical stabilization on and off, manual, automatic focus. It's pretty good for the extra 350 that you're going to pay for this thing. Yeah. And um, it's a macro lens. And I think being able to get the kit lens with macro makes it, makes it enough that I would recommend this lens. I think it's pretty nice. Yeah, yeah, and I see it's got the it's the tromboning type lens as we can come to know and love in kit That's lenses, right? right? Yeah. Now, if you want to spend a little more money, you can pick up the 17 to 55. It costs more. It's not available as a kit lens. It's a shorter range, um, but it's a sharper lens. This is a higher quality lens, so you might want to go this route too. Pretty nice little lens. So price-wise of the 70D, just to bounce back a little bit, what are, what are we looking at? And where is this positioned amongst the other Canon cameras? Yeah, this is, uh, well, this, the 70D is sort of a merging of the 60D and the 6D in the sense that it, um, it's generally it's a 20 megapixel camera upgraded from the 60D. Uh, it's still got the 1.6 crop factor, which is what Canon calls APS-C. Mm -hmm. Seven frames a second. Again, $1,200 body only, $1,550 with that kit lens. Uh, it's got Wi-Fi, which comes from the 6D, uh, which, is, okay. which is handy. Uh, and it's... Uh, it's a 30% faster autofocus in normal use than the 60D. So it's an upgrade from the 60D with a couple of little 6D features thrown in there. Okay. So then, so then the the target for this are those those 60D and 60 users or or shooters. So this is the next logical step from them yeah. for them. And if so, what what do they get? I mean, other than you know, like specifically, if I'm looking at these in the store, and I'm like, okay, you know, it's time for me to upgrade. And I got to make a decision. Why would they be compelled to go get the 70D? Well, if you picked, if you if you knew the 60D and you picked up the 70D, the first thing you'd notice is that the articulating LCD is now touch sensitive. Oh, okay. And okay. as you as you and I have discussed, you know, 
first of all, when articulating LCDs came out, I said, oh, that's a gimmick. Well, I've gotten to love it. Mm -hmm. And then they came out with touch-sensitive screens. I said, oh, that's a gimmick. And now both of us have gotten to love it. And to the point where if a camera doesn't have an articulating LCD that's touch-sensitive, we're a little disappointed, aren't we? Yeah, I'm definitely disappointed. I feel like I need it, especially when you're doing a lot of... I mean, it's not like you want to see yourself all the time, but if you're a one-man band and you're trying to shoot video of yourself on one of these cameras, like you just said, this is you know, designed in a way for people that are shooting video. You want to see yourself. You got to be able to compose it. You got to know when the camera, like, even when the camera dies because it ran out of battery, you got to know, you know, when you're sitting in front of the camera, you can't be running to the back to check it and then running to the front again. Right. So, yeah, I think, I think it's a must-have, just like Wi-Fi. I mean, Wi-Fi is also a must-have. Yeah, so take a look at this now. See, so you open it up, you flip it around. Now it's open because you can actually close it. Uh, then you can turn it and point it back towards yourself, of course. Mm -hmm. You can then angle it up so that you can shoot looking down. Uh, and, of course, you can go the other way. You can tip it down so you can put it up above your head like that. Uh, or you can put it in Frederick Van Johnson mode. and uh, Selfie turn mode. <laughs> Selfie mode, so you can shoot that way, which is... Uh, not as silly as you might think. It's not just for selfies, but if you're ever doing either a group shot or, or you're doing a video with uh, multiple people, it is terrific. So um, yeah. really like the LCD. The touch sensitivity is great. Uh, they've also got a nice uh, quick menu. Let me see if I can show you the quick menu here. And uh, while, while you're can, finding that, I mean, the, yeah. that articulated LCD, I think just that technology, that's kind of the sweet spot. And, you know, we've seen the other cameras like the... You know the some of the NEX cameras and the the Olympus cameras, etc. With just the the one axis LCD that you can either shoot down or shoot up like that. Right. And I find that limited. I mean, that's limited. Why not just put that on every single camera and everyone's happy? Yeah, I mean it's 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 a better than nothing, and mm -hmm. it solves most of my problems because I don't shoot video in particular, uh, in except when I'm doing reviews. Yeah. So. Um, uh, but you're right. I mean, once you have a fully articulating LCD touchscreen, you never go back. Yeah. Uh, and you really get used to it. And so on this one, uh, what's nice is that they've got nice bold stuff. They didn't cram too much into this menu, so it works pretty well. Here's a look at the quick menu button, which, of course, a lot of people have done. Uh, you can adjust, you know, get quickly to ISO. Um, you can get to, oh, all sorts of things. You can get to... Uh, white balance, you can get here's exposure compensation, you can do all these things through the quick menu and I would say it's probably one of the very nicest to use of all the quick menu options uh, I've seen on any of the cameras so far. Very well done. That's cool. Yeah, and that's and that, so basically anything you need to get to quickly, hence quick, quick menu, is right. a, a, pretty much a button press and maybe a tap or two away. Yeah, yeah, really nice. I mean it's the quick menus comparable to another camera we just looked at, which is the um, the Panasonic Lumix GX7. I think they're both sort of in that same category. The uh, uh, Again, nice, bold things, so you don't have to feel like you're on a, a little teeny iPhone keyboard and pressing the wrong keys. You can actually get to what you need to. Yeah, yeah. It seems like they, if iPhone keys are seem to be getting smaller. I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting... My fingers are getting fatter. Um, what about... The, I know you tested a pancake lens as well. You have... Can you show that one? I sure can. Uh, just got to find everything. This is, a, this is a lens that a lot of the Canon people just love, and I see why. First of all, it is tiny. This is a 40 millimeter um, f2.8. It's an STM lens. That's the new lens motor technology that's silent. S for stepper motor, actually stepper motor, but it's very quiet. You can use this for video. This is only $200, $199 for this little teeny pancake lens. Canon people love it. It works on a full frame as well as a crop sensor camera. Um, and it's just a great little lens. And for $200, it's, a, it's an F2.8. F2.8, okay. F2.8. So it's a really nice lens. It turns it into a, a, a great street camera. Now, remember, because this is a crop sensor, that's the equivalent of about a 62 millimeter lens in terms of field of view. So you're getting sort of this average field of view, but you're getting a little bit of the distortion of a wide angle because at the end of the day, it's still a 40 millimeter lens. Right. So right. you need to be a little bit careful with that. But boy, what a great lens for walking around and shooting. Now, okay, so transitioning a little bit. I know, so you are generally a Nikon shooter, I think, you know, and you're testing a Canon camera. Talk to me a little bit about just sort of that transition moving from that sort of Nikon user interface, tactile feel, user experience over to the Canon side. Was it a, truff, a rough transition? Was it easy? How did it go? 
Yeah, and I should explain that I have never until this review shot with a Canon DSLR. Mm. In all the years I've been shooting, um, I've never, I don't know if I've ever even picked one up. So, really? And I'm, yeah, so I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be objective. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, I, I, I am objective in the review, but it's a, it's a bit of a transition. I mean, here's, here's a look at, you know, some of the controls to the top left. You've got the typical uh, PASM dial, as we call it, which is, yeah. you know, program, aperture, shutter priority, uh, and manual. Um, but when you get over to the right side of the camera, and I want to show you this thing. Hang on just a second here, because it is, um, uh, it is something. Uh, I'm going to show you the example. All right, here we go. And the reason we're doing this, the reason this is awkward, I should explain, is that I've pre-recorded some video clips here. If people wonder why the hell I'm snooping around trying to find the right thing to shoot, <laughs> between that and bifocals, nothing's easy, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. It's a so, double whammy. Right. So here are some of the controls on the right side of the camera. Um, what What's with all these buttons you've got over there? I mean, here you've got this wheel on the top for, you know, aperture, you've got the PASM dials we talked about, you've got the rear dial for other stuff. But, you know, take a look at the moment at, here's another clip. Look at this. There are five buttons along yeah, the top. Yeah, looking at that. Yeah. There are so many buttons along the top, it's like a QWERTY keyboard. The middle one even has a little dimple, so you can touch type on this thing. You it's can almost play music up. if you assign like a chord to each one of those. <laughs> you know, they need a plug-in for that or something. But yeah. that's that's the biggest problem that I had. Hang on, let me get rid of that and find my camera here. Um, the That was by far the biggest problem that I had with this thing. Um, but that's something I? you would overcome, right? Especially, like you said, you were, you were used to the Nikon way of doing things and coming over to the Canon side, this is kind of a leap. And after, I don't know, you know, who knows how many accu or how many shots it would take to get your brain around it, but after you jump that leap, then you got it programmed and you know how to use the camera. So once you get the feel of it and you know, you know, you can, it's in muscle memory, is it still kind of, like, do you, do you hit any, like, roadblocks of, okay, this is just ridiculous, I'm going back to Nikon? How did, how did you feel? You're absolutely right in the former, and that is... You know, the biggest difference, people people have said, gee, Doug, are you going to solve once and for all the Nikon versus Canon argument? And unfortunately, I am not. I think these cameras are, camera lines are much, much more similar than they are different. The difference is primarily in the controls, and that difference is philosophical, if anything. And you're absolutely right. Um, even after shooting for a week, uh, probably less than a week, I was able to find things without thinking about them too much. And uh, it works just fine. They're great cameras. Um, I, I, I'm not going to be able to help you solve the Nikon versus Canon decision uh, because I found it just as easy to use. Just, just very different in control philosophy. That's all. Yeah, I think the, the, to solve the Nikon versus Canon decision, we have borrow lenses who right. <laughs> gave you, who graciously provided that camera for us to test. And if you if you're on the fence about Nikon versus Canon. Rent one, shoot for it, shoot with it for a while, then rent the other one, and then find out which one works best with your wiring in your head. You know, there's yeah. no one right decision for anybody. Put it this way: if you have an investment in lenses for either system, I can't see any particular reason to change. There are a few people who've switched to Nikon for the D800 because that's a rather remarkable camera that really isn't matched in the Canon line. Mm -hmm. uh, I assume that's temporary, but I think, as we'll discuss in another episode, I think the big issue here isn't Nikon versus Canon, it's big bodies versus smaller mirrorless bodies. And that's yes. that's the real difference when it comes to that stuff. So um, great, great little camera. We'll talk about it in the, in the wrap up a little more. So uh, what about, again, um, good for video. One of the other, one of the other things that, that you highlighted was the autofocus and they made some changes there. So you want to demystify that a little bit? Okay. Yeah. We're going to spend a couple of minutes on this. Um, that's the biggest technological breakthrough of this camera, which is the what they call the uh, dual pixel autofocus. Now, let's go and walk through a couple of things here. First, you have what's called contrast autofocus. This is something we have in live view and in video for all of our DSLRs and the older mirrorless cameras. They all had only contrast, and that's simply a matter of taking you know, little groups of 100,000 pixels at a time, which doesn't sound like much, but that's less than 1% of the pixels, and looking at those groups and trying to figure out where the adjacent pixels are different, where they're mm -hmm. the most contrasting. And the camera will sit there and say, all right, 
Now I know what the difference is between the pixels. Let's move the lens a little bit and see what happens. Well, if the contrast increases, that means they're moving towards a sharper image, and they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going until they go too far, and the image starts to blur again, and then they come backwards, and they might have to go back and forth, and we call that hunting. Yeah. Uh, and we see that. Back and, that, you know, back right. and forth, yeah. A little breathing in the lens, but we call it hunting, and it's, it's very common in live view. It's very common with version 1 mirrorless cameras and, of course, in video. Okay, now you come into the DSLRs. DSLRs, we think of having a mirror. The light comes in, goes up to the mirror, up through the pentaprism into the viewer, mm -hmm. viewfinder. But the, that mirror is actually partially translucent. Some of the light goes through that mirror, hits a second mirror, and goes down into the bottom of the camera where there's a second sensor, and this is the autofocus sensor. Uh, and that's something that's critical because... Uh, that has to be perfectly aligned with the picture sensor, the image sensor, otherwise your autofocus is going to be a little off. And that's one reason why our DSLRs, some of them allow us to fine-tune the autofocus on a lens-by-lens -lens basis, because mm -hmm. that autofocus sensor might be a little off. Yeah. Um, those those sensors um, are a mix, or, well, they're, they're typically phase detection sensors. Now, as opposed to contrast, Phase detection takes light coming in from two sides, compares them, and it can do something rather remarkable. And that is, it can say, how far off is the autofocus and in what direction? Now, you can't do that mm. with contrast. Mm. So here it's, it can say, oh, I need to focus at this point, and it sends a signal to the lens, and the lens goes kapow right to that point, and then you're ready for the exposure. So phase detection, autofocus until recently, uses a separate sensor, but it gives you much, much faster autofocus. may not be quite as accurate because there's nothing quite as accurate as using the sensor uh, itself, but it's still very fast, and that's what you get on all your high-end cameras. Some of the cameras have cross-point phase detection. Mm -hmm. uh, this camera here has uh, 19 auto phase detection auto points, and they're all cross-type. By the way, the way you tell is the regular phase detect points only will detect vertical edges. If you turn if you have a horizontal em, image horizontal edge you can't focus on it. But if you what? take your camera and you turn it sideways, yeah, try it sometime. If you if you can if you can focus on a vertical line and then you can turn your camera and focus on a line that was horizontal which is now vertical. Well, wait a minute, I've got it backwards. But you get the idea, right? Um, the cross type will focus both on horizontal and on vertical lines. And by testing it, you can see what you've got. Like my big Nikon has 51 autofocus points, and 15 of them are the cross type. The others are just regular phase detection. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. We're so getting then, geeky, so, huh? yeah, that's Yeah, that's very geeky. And you will break that down in the article on your site, right? <laughs> so. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll make this a little less painful. Yes. But yes. Um, so we'll have we'll have the uh, we'll have the, the cheat sheet on your on your website. So, so then this camera itself, yeah. so it's remarkable because it has what kind of it's phase detect, right? Yeah. Well, what's happened is that people with particularly mirrorless cameras, but also people who want to emphasize live view or video, said, well, you know, we've got these wimpy contrast autofocus technologies, how can we upgrade them to phase detection? Well, you've got some people like Fuji um, who started stealing pixels. They basically went into their image sensor and converted some of the pixels to do phase detection autofocus. Hmm. Well, that gives you dead pixels. How do they solve that? I mean, literally, dead pixels. They do that. They, I call it pixel stealing. They do that in their processor by basically figuring out what might have been in that pixel anyway. So interpolation. Uh, interpolation, that's right. Mm -hmm. But let's let's face it, it's only as good as the camera can guess. Yeah. Now yeah. I've you never can't create something from nothing. Well Yeah. I've, <laughs> generally speaking. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I you know, I've uh, they do a really good job, but you'll see in the real high end cameras nobody does this. Yeah. Um but they did that by again converting some of the pixels into this uh, phase detect uh, sensor mode. So now finally we're at this camera. Camera uh, Canon comes along with dual pixel technology in which they've taken virtually all of the pixels on the camera and split them in half so that each half can see one phase or the other of the light coming through the image. That, oh, means, cool. they ha that means they have potentially 20 million phase detect points in the camera. 
Uh, they only use about 80% of them because I think the ones at the edges aren't getting the right kind of light that they need to do this. But still, 80% of the image area is available for phase detection. Mm. And Brilliantly, what they do is uh, you, you can select an area, so you can change the area that is autofocus, like you can in many cameras. But in this case, you're taking advantage of that phase detect technology. Yeah. And when it comes time to actually take a still picture, they just combine the two pixels together and get a regular pixel. They turn off the phase detection part of it. So it's a pretty cool technology. It works great for video. It works great for live view. And it has absolutely no effect on still image when the mirror's down, because this is only when the mirror's up, right? Right, right, right. So, is it, do you think this that kind of technology, this, the pixel splitting or or theft, as you call it, or stealing, um, is this the sort of state of the art now for focusing technologies? In other words, are we going to see this technology migrate over to the mirrorless side and and other DSLR manufacturers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got. Um, Oh, I think almost everybody's doing it. Olympus has it in the OMD EM1. Uh, Fuji has it on their cameras. Um, boy, I, I should know about the Panasonic Lumix, but I'm not. I don't have my notes in front of me. Yeah. Uh, Sony, of course, the new A7 cameras that you got to play with. The A7 has this sort of pixel stealing technology because it's so high res. The A7R does not. Uh, but you actually get that uh, phase detection on the A7. So yes, it is absolutely the wave of the future. Canon has taken it up a notch by basically going to this dual pixel technology, meaning that almost every pixel on the camera can be used for phase detect autofocus. Really, really cool. Okay. So then what else? Before we get to the bottom line about this camera, what, what other anecdotes or data do you think folks need to know about before they make a purchasing decision or rental decision? Well, I think that I think we need to look at the competition for a second. Let's do that and see yeah. what it is out there. And look yeah. at my notes. Yeah, just who so does this, who, who's this guy competing with so, outside of Canon? Yeah, at, at roughly the same price, you've got the Nikon D7100, uh, oh. which I think is a slightly better camera in terms of picture quality, but nowhere near as good for video because if it doesn't have these, this great autofocus technology and the 7100 does not have an articulating LCD. Yep. which I think is, is key. Critical. Uh, even the Nikon, the new D5300, which is only an $800 camera, um, might beat the 70D. You'd want to try to be sure. It's cheaper. Um, it, it does have an articulating LCD. I have not used this camera, but the specs on it look really good. The sensor ratings are very high. And then you've got to look at the Sony NEX7 and NEX6. All of these are the same sensor size, roughly, not quite exactly, but mm -hmm. roughly the same. Uh, NEX6 has some phase detection, autofocus. Uh, I have the 6 and the 7. If I were going to shoot a lot of video, I'd recommend the Canon 70D over the Sonys. Um, uh, oh, they have a tiltable LCD, they don't have touch sensitivity, and the controls on those Sonys, as much as I like those cameras, the controls are just not awful. They're just horrible. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> they're, Tell us how my, you really feel, though. They're on my <laughs> chopping block. Uh, and, then, and then you've also got to consider the Micro Four Thirds cameras. I think this camera beats the, for example, the OMD uh, EM5, mm -hmm. uh, which is an older generation, but now we've got the EM1, which I think is probably better in almost every category, maybe except autofocus again. Mm -hmm. And you've got the um, uh, the Lumix GX7. Again, great camera. Probably doesn't uh, catch up to the video auto autofocus of this camera. So uh, it's you know we have to pick your format first. But um, but when you when you say that when we're competing on video, let's say again taking the the, the Panasonic Lumix GX7 versus the Canon 70D. Looking at it particularly at the video aspect of it, and saying that the GX7 is slightly inferior to the 70D, what are we looking at? Are we looking at it's in, like in other words, inferior for whom? For the filmmaker or just the average person is going to not get quite what they want out of the GX7? How how are you positioning that? Yeah, it, those who are not used to video, it's a very different animal than still photography. First of all. The resolution is far less important. You know, a 1080p image, uh, which is the high end, uh, unless you go to you know 4K or something like, 1080p image is not a very high resolution picture. Mm -hmm. So the megapixels don't matter. Likewise, the noise doesn't matter that much because things are constantly moving, hopefully moving all the time, and you don't notice noise so much when things are moving. But if you're using autofocus, 
that autofocus technology matters a lot. One one test I did with this, which I just loved, was using the autofocus for a focus pull. And that was mm -hmm. a matter of, you know, pointing at something and then simply touching on the screen a different part of my image and having the camera just do a nice, nice smooth autofocus pull to that other object. So I went from foreground to background to foreground just by touching the screen. Yeah. Really nice. Now, you can't control the rate of it. Uh, you can't make it slower or faster, but it does a real nice job uh, of doing it very smoothly. And that's something that you just don't see on most of these other cameras. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm excited. So is this a, what's the bottom line? Should I run out? Should I go get this thing? You know, should uh, uh, well, Canon users you. that are using previous edition, the 60D and the 60D, well, should they just, mm, hey, this is it. This is a camera for me. That's what I was going to say. Do you have other Canon cameras and lenses? Okay. Well, well I have well, a 10D. Does that yeah, count? Okay. No, no, that's not quite the same. <laughs> uh, that's a different animal altogether. Yeah. I would say um, if you already have an investment in Canon lenses, uh, and you're particularly interested in video, this is a good way to go because this is maybe Canon's best SLR for video. Hmm. Of course, they're make video cameras too. Right. If, you're, if you're just getting started, if you don't have Nikons or Canons, the first thing to do is ask yourself, why do you want such a big camera? Because mm -hmm. even though it's a crop sensor, you know, compared to the stuff you and I have been working with recently, this is a monster. Yeah. And do you really want to get into the world of big cameras? Um, maybe you want to impress people when you go to a wedding. I don't know. Uh, I hope I'm past that. Uh, at this point, I think I'm more likely to impress people with you know, my small size. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if nothing else. Not, I am not I'm touching your, that at all. <laughs> so, you know... Um, if you know, if I you're, think that's what we'll title this episode. Doug yeah, impressive it, it, with his small size. If you're, you know, it, it the small cameras give us people who are size challenged an advantage now because we can point out that you know you can be smaller and better. Yes, and we'll get yes. there. All right. If you know, if you're, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep it together here. I know. <laughs> I'm making it as hard for you as I can. If, if you're, you know, if your grandfather. It willed you his old Canon lenses that aren't too old, at least, yeah. uh, and you want to dive in. Sure, go go with Canon and start with this camera because it's a it's a perfectly good way to get started in the Canon line. I would say it maybe is the best way to start in the Canon DSLR line. Um, if you're already in the Canon DSLR line, you buy this only because of the video. There's not much more of an advantage. Um, again, my recommendation is I would buy it with the 18 to 55 kit lens for an extra 350 bucks. I think that's a bargain, sure. um, and because it has a nice macro capability. Um, other than that, no, I don't recommend you rush out and buy Nikon if you haven't started. I want you to look at the smaller cameras first. Look at the smaller cameras. Love it. Perfect. Excellent. And if you are hungry, listeners, viewers, if you're hungry for more, Doug. We'll be posting a review on your on his blog soon. So, Doug, when's that going to go live? Do we know? Does it depend on when this video goes live, or is it that will up be, now? It'll be live within ten seconds of the time this video is live. <laughs> Again, just just go to yeah, the the link is on the video page. It's also in the This Week in Photo blog, and uh, you can go to dougk.com and click click on All About the Gear. It'll be there too. Excellent. And what's next? What's next for All About the Gear? What are we oh, yeah, at? we're having fun. I've got where is it? Here it is. Uh, I have I have the little Sony RX100 version two, and Ooh. see this little, see this little thing on top. This is the electronic viewfinder add-in. Yeah, you can wait, put in there. Wait, I can't see it. Put it on I camera. Know, I know. There it is. That's the electronic viewfinder. This silly little thing cost half as much as the camera. So um, I'm trying it out just because borrow lenses let me do that. Wow. But this is the camera, the normal camera that you would use, the RX100R. And uh, it is, by some people's estimation, the very best point-and-shoot out there. And I've, I've only had it for a few days now, but so far I like it a lot. And uh, we'll see. It'll be in Episode 10 of All About the Gear. Excellent. One, one quick question about that, uh, not to take away from the review that's coming. Does that thing have Wi-Fi in it? Uh, yes, it does. Awesome. Okay. It has Wi-Fi. It has the Sony uh, downloadable apps. And check this out. It has at least a tiltable screen. It oh, look at not, that. Doesn't articulate. Doesn't articulate. And it's not touch sensitive. But ugh, get the right view here. But you can see it is tiltable, which is nice. Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? I just want I want articulated touch screen on everything. 
Just yeah. <laughs> articulated touchscreen Wi-Fi audio input. That's it. Yeah. That's all I need. I'm with you. I'm with you. And you know, one of my favorite cameras, the Fuji, doesn't even have uh, articulation. So there you mm. go. Mm. Okay. They're, get, they're all getting there. All right, Doug K. Thank you. It's been another awesome review and another episode of All About the Gear. And uh, I guess we'll see you in episode 10, right? All right. Thanks, Frederick. See you then. All right. See you later. Bye-bye.